was um, in willing in the most charming and uh, gracious way to um, speak for us to do the first of our um, of, of, of our virtual lectures to put up with uh, to put up with the the experimental dimension of this um, fitting in with any plans that we may have and um, now Yossi Garfinkel Professor Yossi Garfinkel is well known to um, almost everybody. He's lectured in this society, I think. He's lectured um, in London uh, more than once in recent years and in Manchester, I think once or even twice for us. Um, he is one of, as you know, one of Israel's very top archeologists. He is the Yigal Yadin Professor of Archeology span of the Land of Israel. Uh, at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, and he is the head of its extremely prestigious Institute of Archaeology. Um, he was for many years a prehistorian um, and um, working on Neolithic and Chalcolithic sites, which as many of you know are pretty important um, all over Israel. Uh, but then most famously, um, between 2007 and 2013, his famous excavation at Kirbet Kefaya, and then other uh, settlements in the area around, looking uh, for urban development in the era um, of King David around 1000 uh, BC. Um, this work is still being digested and processed. Um, and has um, attracted widespread attention. Since 2013, he has been excavating at um, Tel Lachish, um, not very far away in that same, uh, I suppose it's the um, Shvela um, area. Um, so, but to Today, um, the lecture that we've cho chosen to give us has um, both a Lachish dimension and a very different dimension. Um, it is about a, uh, a murder mystery, which um, we hope will, uh, 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 which I'm sure will intrigue you all. Um, the murder of James Leslie Starkey, the discoverer of Lachish. Over to you, Yossi. Okay, <clears throat> uh, Tessa, thank you so much for the introduction. Thank you, Anthony, for taking care. It's also a great pleasure to see all of you, and specifically three people that I know better than the other. Barbara Barnett, it's a pleasure to see you again. And uh, to see Wendy Sloninka, the granddaughter of, of uh, Starkey. She has, they have a wonderful archive, archive at uh, their home including, for example, a letter sent by Hilda Starkey to uh, the widow Starkey. So very interesting uh, historical material in the house. And then Rachel uh, Sparks, it's uh, also a pleasure to see you again. And I hope to see you again in London when things will become uh, clearer again. So without uh, much delay, I will start with the presentation. And I don't want to talk just about the murder of Starkey because it's a bit uh, depressing. <laughs> and I think we should uh, put, uh, I want to describe the, 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 the entire expedition and then the murder is unfortunately at the end of the fieldwork, but uh, it even continue later. So <clears throat> in my lecture, I, I have five parts. We start with the first part and this is searching for ancient Lachish. This is today the accepted site of Lachish, but it was not like this for more than 100 years. And the search for Lachish or the interest in Lachish starting or started more than 200 years ago. Already Lord Byron in 1815 wrote the famous uh, poem about Sennacherib. I, I don't know if I should read it because my Hebrew accent, accent, accent will destroy the poem. <laughs> Anyhow, but think about it. 1815, what could uh, Lord Byron uh, knew about Sennacherib? No research in Mesopotamia, no archaeology in the Near East. So all his knowledge came from the Bible. And in the Bible, Sennacherib is associated with Lachish. 
So already Lord Byron uh, put Lachish and Sennacherib on the map. And why it's so important? Because Byron was a leading figure in the Romantic movement that led to deeper interest in the history and cultures of the ancient Near East. And very soon after, real research started in the region. So this is uh, the beginning of uh, interest, uh, historical and archaeological interest in the ancient Near East, and Lachish is already there in the first moment. Later, 1838, Robinson and Smith make survey of uh, places uh, all over Palestine. They documented 100, probably more than 1,000 place names. And if a name, Arabic name, was similar to a name that appeared in the Bible, they suggested that this is the location of the biblical site. And in this way, they found a place called Um Lakish. In Arabic, it means Madur of Lakish, Um Lakish. It's uh, 10 kilometers from uh, nowadays Lakish. And they suggest that ancient Lachish was in Um Lachish. Okay, another decade passed in 1847, Layard excavating in uh, Nineveh, one of the first uh, excavation ever done in Mesopotamia, and he discovered the palace of Sennacherib and the relief, the famous relief that now uh, in the British Museum, and you have the name Lachish and you have the name Sennacherib inscribed in cuneiform uh, script on this uh, relief. So this was really amazing discovery. And till today, so many hundreds and hundreds of articles have been written about the relief, about the biblical text, about the archaeological site. This is really a combination of uh, different um, aspects uh, of uh, modern research, iconography, text, archaeology, and so on. So really just this uh, relief deserved a lecture for itself. Okay, another 30 years or so, we have the famous survey of Western Palestine conducted by Conrad, Condor and uh, Kitchener. And they saw Um Lakish, they saw it's a very poor place and they decided that the real Lakish is in a nearby Tel, Tel El Chesi. And this is how Lakish moved from Um Lakish to Tel El Chesi. Few years, another 20 years or so, 1890, Petri, the famous archaeologist, he came to, to Um Lakish first. He checked it for three days. He decided there's nothing there uh, from earlier period, only Byzantine remains. And then he moved to Tel El Chesi. And in Tel El Chesi, Petri recognized two basic archaeological principles. One, that the mound is an accumulation of many levels, many cities that have been built one on top of the other. This is what we call stratigraphy. And then he knew it already from Egypt, but then it was much clearer that in each level, each level is characterized by different type of pottery. This is what we call typology. Until today, every archeologist in every site in the world, when he's excavating, he had to take care about the stratigraphy and about the typology. So all these the two basic principles, the, same, the two metho basic methodologies of archeological research worldwide, have been formulated in Tel El Chesi. And why? Because Petri believes that this is biblical Lachish. A few years later, the Lamarna tablet have been uh, published, and there are five letters written from the kings of Lachish to the pharaoh in Egypt. So you can see that Lachish is connected to Mesopotamia on the one hand and to Egypt on the other hand. Only in uh, 1929, Albright, the famous biblical archaeologist, uh, identified Lachish at Tel Edward. And this is nearly 50 years after, uh, or 40 years, yeah, 50 years after Petri excavation at Tel El Chesi. And we, Albright uh, took the historical information and the, the character of the site, and he suggested that biblical Lachish was located at Tel Edward. So Tel Edwer is ancient Lachish. But this should be within a question mark because it was only a suggestion. But when Starkey start excavating there, very soon it became uh, clear that this is indeed Lachish, basically because of the Lachish letters that I will mention later. So 19, 1932, 1938, James Leslie Starkey start uh, an expedition to Lachish. 
They started in the field in November 32, large scale excavation started at Tel Edouard under the direction, directorship of James Leslie Starkey. The expedition includes two other prominent scholars, Olga Tafnel and Gerard Lancaster Harding. Olga Tafnel, after the murder of Starkey, Olga Tafnel stayed another 20 years and published all the excavation uh, reports. Uh, Harding got a position of uh, the director of antiquities of uh, Jordan, and he uh, moved to Amman and he was involved with different uh, projects. The most famous of all is, of course, the Dead Sea uh, Scrolls and Qumran. So he was involved with these uh, activities. Later, other scholars, uh, prominent scholars dealt with Lachish. This is the future, so I will not talk about it. I, I'm, I'm only mentioning that Yohanan Aroni excavated at uh, Lachish. David Osiskin had a huge project of 20 years. Igel Yadin wrote a few articles about Lachish, and many other uh, prominent scholars uh, were involved. <clears throat> I will not talk about it today. But altogether, for 200 years, Lachish played a major role in every development that took place in ancient Near Eastern studies, Mesopotamia, Egypt, biblical studies, and archaeological methods. So Starkey made the right uh, decision by excavating at uh, Tel Edouard. Now the second question that we can deal with and we, is how, the, how does an archaeological project been organized? What do you need in order to organize excavation or expedition. So you need staff, you need funds, and you need a site. So I want to uh, look briefly at each one of these uh, aspects. Fund, okay. It's not, so the fund uh, were, in, were obtained mainly from the Wellcome uh, Trust. It was, it was not even called Wellcome Trust in the beginning. It was the Wellcome Research Institute. Here you can see a picture of uh, Sir Henry Welcome. He has a very, uh, he was a very uh, wealthy uh, person with a lot of um, medical and um, pharmacological uh, industries. And he created the Welcome Trust, which is uh, located today at uh, Euston Road in uh, central London, a very beautiful building with a museum to the history of uh, medicine. Anyhow, he uh, took upon himself to uh, support large part of the expedition. Then there was also Colt, an American that was involved for a year, and then Charles, Sir Charles Marston. He was a rather a Christian fundamentalist. He wrote books like The Bible is True. So he was interested uh, to prove the Bible. Then we also have Sir Robert Mond. He was an uh, important Egyptologist, among other but he also has uh, some industries, the uh, metal industries, and he also helped in sponsoring the excavations. But what is amazing in this case is not just the, the six years of field work. You know, everybody gets some money for field work from National Geographic, from Donner, from here, from there. But, by, but after the end of the, season, the last season, for 20 years, Olga Tafnel were sitting and publishing the results of the excavations from 39 till 59, 50, uh, from 38 to 58, 20 years. She has no university position. Who sponsored her? I always wonder, I was always wondered how old that Olga Tafnel managed to survive 20 years without any clear position and to work on Lachish. And the real, and the answer is uh, Robert Dale. Robert Dale got, got Nobel Prize. In 1936, he was a medical, he did a biology, biology and a physiology, and he discovered how nerves are operating in our body and got Nobel Prize for this. He was the head of the Wellcome Trust for about 20 years, and he sponsored Tafnil. This is amazing, the commitment. When I'm thinking about these things, that the Wellcome Trust has a committee of 20 years. Can you see today any foundations that giving money for archaeological project will sponsor the project for 20 years, 26 years? All you get is two years, three years, five years, and that's it. Nobody cares. So this was really something exceptional in the history of archaeology. Okay, staff. 
the staff is quite easy. It's, they basically work together for some years, some of them two years, some of them five years. They work with Sir Clindis uh, Petrie and his wife, Lady Petrie. Some of them even in Egypt. Later, they work in Tel Jama and then in Tel El Ajul. <coughs> and another site, I forgot the third site, <coughs> but there were three sites that they were excavating uh, together. And then they decided to leave. Petrie was uh, over 70 years old and he was not so uh, brilliant probably anymore. And uh, there was a lot of, critici a lot of uh, criticism were about his method and about his, uh, the way he was excavating. And these three people, <coughs> Starkey, Harding, and Tufnell, they were much younger. They were in their 30s or so. So it was uh, 40 years different. And the, it was a time for them to start their own career and to start their own uh, excavations. So they left <coughs> Petri, and where did they go to? Okay, you can see here a nice uh, photo of three of them. I think that the fourth one is the photographer, Brown, but I was not sure, so I didn't add his name. But you can see Harding, Tufnell, and Starkey <coughs> together. So <coughs> when I start, and I don't know if you know, but I'm working on now for eight years or so, on, uh, on uh, the first expedition to Lachish. I even spent a sabbatical here in King, King's College and they worked a lot in the archive in the British Museum and in the Wellcome Trust. And I also met Wendy during this year. <clears throat> Anyhow, the first letter that I managed to find in, about this expedition is dated the 7th of June, 1932. And this is a letter written by uh, Starkey to the Wellcome Research Foundation. And he telling about the, the project, about their experience, and he said that they want to excavate in Tel Erani. You know where is Tel Erani? Tel Erani at the time was believed to be ancient gut. And Starkey wrote, every kid in the street know what is gut. You know, it's appearing in the lament of David over Saul. So they were really thinking about excavating uh, in Tel Erani. And for two or three months, this is the name of the site. This is the name of the site. <clears throat> but somehow they switched to tell a, a dwer, to Lachish, and I never found any word in written word why they make this uh, change. What caused them to move from uh, Irani to, uh, to dwer or from Gat to uh, Lachish? But I think that they made a good uh, decision because Tel, uh, Tel Erani is not a very prominent uh, site. Most of the levels there are dated to uh, the early bronze. So it's the third millennium BC. And when it was excavated, the big surprise was that there was no Philistine levels at the site. So it cannot be biblical gut. It was a mistake in the identification. And here you see the first photograph ever taken of Tel Achish. It was taken by John Garstang, another important British archaeologist. He visited the place in uh, 1928, and you can see the site, the, uh, the site before any archaeologist do, did any harm. You know, even once grain of sand has not been removed yet from uh, the site when this photograph was taken. So now we know something about why it's good to excavate in Lachish, and we also know how uh, Starkey organized staff, uh, this uh, fund, and how he chose, or, why, or how the, the process of choosing the site. Now the third thing is to organize the logistics. And there were problems like transportation, access to the site, the building the excavation camp, supply of food and water, local manpower, excavation spoil and insurance and safety issues. You know, today we just take a plane and we go from uh, London to Israel in four or five hours. And then you can take a car and drive to which site, uh, any site that you want to excavate. And there are no problem to have a camp because you can have, find a kibbutz nearby or a small hostel to stay. And you know, we have what? Food everywhere and running water. Nothing of this uh, was at the time, in the early 1930s, everything was a huge, there was huge difficulties in each one of these aspects. The transportation, for example, is a completely different uh, geography than today. They took a boat, a passenger boat or passenger ship from England to where? 
to, to Port Said, to Jaffa or Haifa. But usually they prefer Port Said. I think they were fast uh, ships going to India. <clears throat> so they used uh, to take a boat to Port Said. And then what do you do from Port Said? You take a train from the port to Gaza. And then from Gaza, you need to take a taxi to Lachish. So it was a, a long journey. And during the Arab revolt, Starkey wrote a nice, uh, com a nice uh, note that I will like uh, to, read it, to read here. The journey uh, to Gaza station, that means from Port Said to Gaza station, was quite, un now I, I can't read it because I see some of the picture here. It was quite okay, despite the fact that the telephone wires connecting Gaza and Kantara has been cut. And the authorities feared that the line had been mined, so that the third class had been put in front of the train and the first class behind. <laughs> so, you know, if something will happen, the first class will be saved because they are at the back. And transportation, they had to create a road leading to the site and they also built a small bridge to cross over local uh, valleys. And uh, it was not so simple because in winter when there were floods, this doesn't help. And there are even uh, stories that uh, they used donkeys. One of the Arabs brought donkeys one and the, the supply of food was uh, brought into the camp over the floods with a donkey. Maybe I will uh, show it later when I talk about food. But this, everything was a problem here when they uh, organized the excavations. And then the expedition camp. When they came, they lived in tent in the first two, three weeks, and they built in the first, you can see here, so, uh, this photograph was taken maybe after one month of the first season, and they start to build a place, an ex excavation camp to, to live and then to organize the, the, the equipment and the find and everything had to be organized in the expedition camp. From here, from here to here, uh, Starkey, the camp became bigger and bigger. I can really say that Starkey was obsessed with logistics. And you can see that he all the time added another room and another laboratory and another things. Again and again, this was a major uh, thing that motivate his uh, activities to have everything bigger and better and faster and more, bet and more impressive. So this is the camp more or less toward the end of the, the expedition. You can see here one of the working space. You can see the pottery was stored in uh, shelves and they have a table to sit and write and analyze the material. In this picture, you can see Olga Tafnel standing behind and uh, Lancaster Harding sitting near the table. Even have a nice library, as you can see, so they can read reports or few reports that have been published on other excavations at that time. Okay, now they have a, a need for food and water. Again, you cannot just go to a, near, to a supermarket. So they used it to go once a week or so, or two weeks to Gaza. This was the market city, the big market city in the region, not Hebron, not Jerusalem and they went to uh, Gaza uh, to uh, bring the supply. And here you can see the story about uh, it was a flood and uh, the road uh, was uh, disconnected. The, the cars that brought the food was not able uh, to cross into the camp. So one of the Egyptian workers who has donkeys, two donkeys, managed to uh, cross the load and bring uh, fresh food into uh, the camp. And then you can see uh, the last sentence, we still have a good stock of iron, something it can be. They brought also a dry, not a preserved food in can, in iron cans, which was used uh, as food. This is the only place where I found any information about food. In all the 20,000 archives, there's hardly any information about how they organized uh, food to the exhibit, to the expedition. And then there is also, uh, the, in 1936, the Arab revolt started in Palestine. It was a big, uh, there was strike, transportation uh, strike, and uh, trade strike. And here you can see a story, the butcher. So they also have meat, apparently. 
The butcher agreed to deliver the meat some distant outside the town, the town of Gaza, outside of Gaza, while the most fanatic section of the population were devotedly at prayer. Okay, so you can see here is an attitude to the locals in a way and uh, how they managed to organize food despite these difficulties. In water, there was no running water. They had to uh, bring water from wells, like as they, uh, you can see here, some of the local populations that came with a jar, sometimes with a donkey or even with a camel, and the expedition had to do the same. No running water at the camp. This is the dining room. They have a bakery and they probably have one or two locals that were cooks, where the cook, the cooks and prepare the food. But the day this photograph was taken was a very special day because the Swedish crown prince visited the excavation and also the High Commissioner of Palestine came with him. And they probably did the, the, the chef did his best, you can imagine. And indeed, he got a very nice compliment from the Swedish crown prince. He said that the pudding is much better than that in the palace. Now, uh, the, the European or the, the British, there were not more than six, seven, eight people, but the entire expedition were about 160. So about 150 people were employed by the excavation as a working force. And you can see a nice uh, gender uh, division. The men used to dug, and women and children used to remove soil uh, with basket or on their head. And also when there was when they sift, and this expedition did a lot of sifting, even wet sifting. Despite the problem with water, sometimes they did wet sifting. It's written in the documents. And Starkey said it's a great way to find scarabs. And this was forgotten, and only 20 years ago, 10 years ago in Jerusalem, people start to do wet sifting again, and they found the uh, seal impressions and all kinds of uh, small important objects. So wet sifting is something ex extremely important in excavation if you really want to collect all the finds, and it was already practiced at the site of Lachish. Most of the workers came from the nearby village of Kubebe. And you can see there were farmers, Falachim in Arabic. But there was also a group of uh, Bedouins that came from Gaza, the Gaza area. These are people who excavated with Petri 10 or 20, 15 years uh, before, or 10 years before, and some of them left Petri with Starkey and they came and excavated at Lachish. But they, they were not permanent, so they came only for uh, six months or five months. They came with their families and with the tent, and they lived nearby. They participated in the excavation, and uh, by the end of the season, they went back again to the Gaza area. Now the excavation produced enormous uh, amount of uh, spoil. You can see here uh, piles and piles of stones and piles and piles of sediment. And Starkey organized a light train, what is called the Kuvil train, to evacuate uh, all this sediment outside, <coughs> outside the tail. So you can remove these line, the, the rails as you wish. It's very easy uh, to do it. By the end of uh, when, by the end of this, the, expedi the expedition, when they sold the equipment, he has nearly two kilometers of rails, which is enormous uh, amount. 10 years before, there is a, if you will read about Howard Carter that excavated the tomb of Tutankhamun, he uh, organized all these wonderful treasures in uh, heavy wooden boxes, and he thought that porters will take them to the Nile, and from the Nile to Cairo. But they were so heavy that porters were not able to remove the, the boxes of Tutankhamun. The distance from the grave to the Nile was about uh, five miles. So the de Department of Antiquity of Jordan organized, uh, Department of Antiquity of uh, Egypt organized light trains like this, but they have only 30 yards, only 30 meters or so. <clears throat> so what happens, they put the, the cranes 
on the on a wagon like this for 30 meters, then they had to dismantle the back and put it in front, move 30 meters, dismantle and put it again. It has to be done hundreds of thousands or over thousands of times for the treasure of Tutankhamun to get from the, from the grave to the Nile. And here Starkey, 10 years later, has two kilometers of these uh, rails. And you can see how they push the, uh, the, 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 the truck. It says three quarter of uh, square, square meters, so it could take something like nearly two ton. And uh, then they dump it down. They took it to the edge of the site. And in order to let it go down, they built this huge installation. If you come today to Lachish, you can st still see a large segment of this uh, installation in the north, uh, in northwest corner of the, of the site. So Starkey added another level to Lachish. It's level zero, if you want to call it, because level one is from the Persian Hellenistic. But Starkey also added a level to the site of Lachish. And in one place, when they removed heavy stones, they created like a, a funiculaire. There was two cables connected, and the one who went down pushed up the empty one. Okay, the last thing about the logistic is the safety uh, issue. I will not go into all of it, but you, what you see here is a nice photograph that I saw in the expedition uh, archive. And this is a guy that uh, uh, drilling into the rock and then with gunpowder, they uh, explode it. When they have small rocks, people took them out. But when you have a rock like this, which weight may be ton or two tons inside the excavations, you cannot take it. What we are doing today, we're bringing a beko which can lift it and take it out. But uh, at the time, they didn't have such uh, equipment in the excavation. So this guy used to drill in and blew the, uh, the rocks. Now there is this lady, uh, Veronica Seton Williams, an Australian uh, archaeologist. She worked also in Lachish in the last season. And in uh, 1988, she wrote uh, memories and five or six pages are devoted to Lachish. And then she is talking that one day, however, Abu Tawil, and now we know the name of the guy. In the expedition, we have only a photograph. Here we have his name, but Abu Tawil is not really a name, it's a nickname. In Arabic, it means a tall guy. So she's telling us that he was uh, absent-minded, and uh, one day he didn't go fast enough from the trench, and he blew himself out. So this is just an example, at least he came alive out of it. But I found in the records that two people were killed in work accidents. And think about it, six, um, 150 people working six months a year. And you know, we have rocks and you have uh, cliffs and you have the, the, the car, the, the cable, the train. One of the person was killed because rock fell on him and he was uh, wounded. So this was uh, an important uh, thing to look at, the, the aspect of safety. Now major discoveries, it was quite hard because we don't have much time. I decided to concentrate only on two <clears throat> of the most important uh, discoveries made by the uh, by Starkey expedition. The first one is already in the, discovered in the first season, but it was excavated till the sixth uh, season. And this is a Canaanite temple, it's called the Foss Temple, which uh, is uh, from the late Bronze Age, from the 16th to 13th centuries BC. And why it's so important? They discovered three levels in this uh, temple. In each one of them, they found local Canaanite pottery, which has been changed over time. They found Egyptian scarabs and other Egyptian materials that enable them to date each one of the three levels. And then they also found uh, pottery from Cyprus and from Greece, Mycenaean pottery and the uh, Cypriot pottery. And this was a connection between Africa, Asia, and Europe. Not more than that, okay? Not less, not more. The really uh, important and most important uh, uh, site that connect, or a building that connect the archeologies of Egypt and Europe together in the Levant. Then the Lachish letters, about 20 uh, letters written in ancient uh, Hebrew uh, script, and they are dated to the last uh, years, or some people even like to say the last week of the Kingdom of Judah. 
and you can see here two scholars, two scholars from Hebrew University who came to look at them, Benjamin Mazar and another guy. But in the end, the mission was given to uh, Tur Sinai. He was a, a Semitic linguistic, linguistist, and uh, he was the one who was sitting a few years, decipher and publish the Lachish letters. So everything was great, everything was perfect. But, okay, now is the big but. There were problems with the landowners. And while it was uh, relatively simple, uh, now what is the landowner? You have the, the tail. So what is, you have the surrounding of the tail, which is a huge area around. You have the slopes. The slopes are uh, tilted and they're not good for agriculture. And then you have the top of the site. The top of the site is rather limited, but this is the most important area because here you have the cities. And if you want to excavate the cities of the tail, you must have access to the top of the site. And what happens is that Starkey got access to, uh, to excavate the slopes and to excavate around the site, but he didn't get permission from the landowner. They were very stubborn and they, didn't, uh, they couldn't get to any, any agreement. Here you can see the site of Tel Lachish. You can see what is called, uh, you can see the black line around. These are the fortifications that Starkey excavated all over the site for two kilometers in the first season and part of the second season. And he did it just because he didn't have access to excavate the tail itself. Here you can see a close up of excavating this city wall for nearly two kilometers. And it didn't give him any real information. It was enough to excavate 20 meters of it. But he worked, took, he excavated all of it because he didn't have anything else to do with the manpower. And here uh, you can see the top of the site. This is, uh, by the way, the palace of the kings of Judah before it was excavated. It was already standing as a prominent feature. And Starkey was exhausted. A year and a half, he was negotiated with the landowner. And in one of the places he wrote, I shall not be privileged to live long enough to see the end of this transaction. He was really desperate. Then, then one evening, the three families that said that they are the owners of the land came to the camp and they were ready to sell it for two pounds for one dunam. And together it's about 80 dunams, so he had to pay them something like 160 uh, pound. He pays them half. He was so exhausted, he didn't bargain. And I think that this was the most uh, uh, severe mistake he did, in, he did in his life, because he had to bargain. If they want two pound, he had to say, no, I'm paying one. And in the end, they will uh, come to a, something like pound and half, and everybody will be happy. But he was so exhausted, he agreed to pay two pound without arguing. And what's happened? Landowner went home and they said, oh, if we, if we want, if we agree to pay two pounds without bargaining, we had to ask more. So they repeated the agreement, but they didn't give him back the, the payment. So he paid half and he didn't get access to the site. He, he stuck. And it was already toward the end of the second season. He couldn't go on with this thing. So what happened now? He wrote a letter <coughs> to, uh, the, to the Department of Antiquity and they started expropriation a process. And you can see that on 12th of April, 1934, <coughs> there was an official uh, announcement in the Palestinian Gazette. This is the uh, government uh, newspaper that publishing uh, new laws. And uh, I, Lieutenant General Sir Arthur, Arthur, and so on and so forth, and look what he's doing. He's expropriating for excavation the land of Tel Achish. Then Starkey had to deposit 110 pound in the treasury of the government for compensations to the, land, to the landowners. He already paid 80, 82, or 81. And then he, has, he deposited 210 pounds as well in the treasury of uh, the government of Palestine. However, this was not paid. And what's happened when the, the, the land department start to or want to organize the compensation, it turned out that it belonged to, all, to much more than three families. 
and, and there was cross ownerships. And some people died, and the, the, the many people said that they are the inherited. It was a whole mess, and there was not a, they were not able to pay compensation. I wrote an article about this uh, five years ago, in a, and I wrote that the land owner were never paid. But I was mistaken. Recently, I found uh, letters, three letters from 1943. This is long after everything uh, stopped at uh, Lachish, and it turned out that in the end, compensation were paid, but only in 1943. But now look what happened to the landowner. They, they got half, and, but all the land was taken. They didn't get the other half, and they start uh, pressing Starkey. And there are a few letters that he sent to the land uh, department about what's happening with the compensation. I will not go all to all these things because we don't have enough uh, time, but it's very clear that they didn't, they were not paid and they were planning revenge. And this was the, <clears throat> the chance. On the 10th of January, 1938, Starkey left Lachish in the evening to go to the ceremony. Uh, uh, the next day there was uh, supposed to be the ceremony of the opening of the Rockefeller Museum and Starkey was invited to give the keynote address. And what's happened, that on his way to Lachish, you can see here the map, from Lachish, he went to Bet Jubrin, and from Bet Jubrin to uh, Hebron, and from Hebron to Jerusalem. But two kilometers before Hebron, the taxi was stopped, he was, uh, he was asked to go out, and he was shot and killed. The taxi driver was allowed to go. And the truck, taxi driver, probably uh, when he just came to the police, he told one story. Two days later, he, was, he told another story. So he didn't tell the truth. Probably the murderers told him, if you open your mouth, we'll kill you too. So, and Olga Tafnel sent, uh, and uh, Ian, who was uh, who replaced Starkey, sent letters to London just 10 days after the murder, and they write, it's very hard to know what's happened because the driver giving, gave two different versions. So I don't know exactly what's happened, but <clears throat> Starkey came out, the people, the murderer took talk with him. Why they had to talk with him? They could shoot and run away. But they talked with him. And this is very important because you can see here, this is the death certificate. This is in the, uh, Wendy have it in uh, the family archive the death certificate of the Department of Health, Government of Palestine. This is the, the funeral. Next day, 11th of January, they didn't open the Rockefeller Museum. There was the official funeral, funeral of uh, Starkey, and the Rockefeller Museum was open a day later, on the 12th of January, 1938. Now, till today, people believe that Starkey was murdered in a terror attack. And this indeed characterized Palestine during the years 36 to 39, the time of the Arab revolt. <clears throat> On the road from Hebron to Jerusalem, they were shooting every day. But Starkey was not murdered on the road from Hebron to Jerusalem. He came from a side road. There were hardly anybody driving in this, in this road. No uh, gang will make ambush in this place because they can wait three days and nobody will pass. So they were waiting for him. And I think, and also when the police came with dogs, what happened, the dogs in the first time went to the west, toward Lachish and Kubebe. This is where the, the murderers ran away, back to the village of uh, Kubebe. But what the British police did after three days or four days, they took somebody from Hebron and somebody from Chalchul, which is to the east of the, uh, the murder place, and one of them was hung about two weeks later. <clears throat> but this, uh, this is not uh, what was the evident by the dogs. The dogs went to the east, uh, to the west in uh, the beginning. So what I think is that the debate with the landowners about the, and the, about the land and the, the fact that the compensations were not paid. This is, uh, and all these events that usually when they have a terror attack, the, the, the gang used to shoot and run away. But in this case, they stopped the car, they took Starkey out, they talked with him, and only then they shoot. 
So it's not a regular, it's not the regular pattern of a terror attack, and I think that this was a planned assassination. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, fantastic. Uh, a uh, wonderful lecture, I'm sure you will all agree, and almost perfect timing because we started a little late, and I think we can still, we can allow ourselves until about quarter past five for the um, questions. Um, Anthony, would you like to repeat what people have to do? Um, yes. Oh haven't already, then there's a chat button um, along with the suite of other buttons which you can press. You can type your question for Yossi. Um, the only thing you have to do is make sure that it is directed towards Tessa rather than me. The um, Zoom has a glitch and it doesn't allow co-hosts to look at chat, only one or the other. So um, if you like to do that, or if you've done that already, I don't know, because I can't see it, um, but Tessa can, then um, I'm sure Yossi would be delighted to answer questions. You can, by the way, um, there's a little button called reactions. And if you push it, there's a, there, there's a pair of clapping hands. And you <laughs> might want to show your appreciation, as I'm about to do, by clapping your hands. Or we could do it this way. Or you could do it that way, or indeed both. Thank you. Indeed, and I should have uh, invited applause, which is certainly well deserved. So I have my chat facility open, and so far um, nobody has, as far as I can see, sent me a message is that right please do wave your hands or use the hand wave if you think you've sent me a, a message saying you want to ask a question and if you haven't please go ahead and do so i'm sure there are lots of questions or indeed um anything you'd like to add perhaps wendy uh I'm... Uh, i have one comment I mean, until Yossi uh, raised this theory a few years ago, it had never been raised before. And we always assumed that Grandfather was just the unlucky victim of the bandits on the road. But the family still feel that it's more likely that than an assassination. Uh, he was really well loved by everybody. And also, isn't it a bit like cutting off your nose to spite your face? Because he employed so many hundreds of people that they're actually losing their their main source of income by killing him, in a way. So thank uh, okay. you, Wendy. May I just yes. ask to clarify, are you saying the, the family was never particularly puzzled or, or there was, they had a sense of unease yes. about... It's uh, always been um, a mystery until Yossi came up with his theory. No one had ever suggested that before. It had never been suggested by any of the authorities at the time. Uh, there was just no hint of anything like that happening, uh, that being a so cause. Um, the situation is uh, more complicated. Oh. Sorry. You, you, you the, I want to, we need to understand how it used to work. If somebody gave a, a land to the expedition, they paid, either they rent it and paid the yearly sum, or they bought it. But then they took the people in the family and occupied them and gave them job in the excavations. Now what's happened to the families who had the land in the top of the site and didn't let Starkey to excavate? He didn't employ them. So the people who worked there, and these were 150 people, they were good friends of Starkey. No one of them would kill him. But what about three families that the land was taken, they got only half of the money and they didn't work? They saw all the other 100 people working, but their family didn't enjoy it. So they not only revenge for taking the land, they were extremely uh, jealous. Yeah. And after, uh, after uh, in the break between the third and the fourth season, 
a group of people came to the dig house. There were only three guards. They locked the guard. They steal some of the money there, and they said, the next time we'll come, we'll burn the place. What does it mean the next time we'll come? This is a clue to Starkey. It's like protection in a mafia. If you will not pay us, we'll come next time and we'll burn the camp house. And uh, all the, the, the big report was stay in Jerusalem and the antiquity department sent to Starkey only one uh, uh, short uh, telegraph, you know, just uh, 20 words word or 10 words instead of describing the whole event. There were clues that things are not going well. And I think Thank that uh, I, I agree with you that hundreds of people enjoy the work. Nobody of them, they were very sorry when Starkey was murdered. But what about the three families? They didn't sell the land. No, but they didn't get their land either. Um, it just doesn't achieve anything because then they would just replace Starkey with somebody else and the work would carry on. It seems an extreme thing. Mm -hmm. And it's well, still hard. On, to on, on that note, may I bring in another question from Hugh? Uh, hello, Hugh. Would you like to express it yourself or shall I? Uh, why don't you? Oh, you're muted. Uh, oh, we can't can hear you. Can you hear me now? Now we can, yes. Yes, sorry, the pictures have all gone off my screen, but uh, uh, well, I, thank you so much for a great lecture and uh, very interesting. Um, I worked with Osishkin for a number of seasons at Lachish, so I'm interested to know, Yassi, how you respond to his article in which he takes issue with your theory about the murder of Starkey. Uh, you, you talked about the dogs and so on. Um, he does present a different story, so I'd just be glad to hear your side of it. David is a very interesting uh, person, <laughs> and uh, I don't know if you know, but he published maybe 30 or 40 articles where he claims that the uh, stratigraphy in Jericho is not good, and the stratigraphy in Shechem is not good, and this and that, and he criticized everything. But all the report of Lachish is like a Bible for him. He just accept 100% of everything that Olga Tafnel, or almost 100% of everything that Olga Tafnel said. And uh, that's why he thinks that uh, the British indeed, uh, that he was, it was a terror attack. And he also believed that uh, the police, the British police found the murderer and hanged him. He said, well, look how fast the, 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 the righteous uh, system work in uh, the British uh, mandate. But I think they just took somebody who was probably worse hanging because he did other bad things. And they uh, stuck to him the murder of Starkey as well. If you really read the report, <clears throat> you see you get a different picture. That's, uh, you, did you see my article in uh, Palestine Exploration? Yes, indeed, uh, yes. I, I saw your oh. article and, and his replies. I was just interested in how you, uh, how you took the evidence that he brought about the police inquiry and so on. He didn't uh, brought any new uh, data. He just uh, repeated again what was said before. So I didn't even write a response. What shall I say? He didn't say anything new. But there is one, I work on many archives, more than 10. <clears throat> one, <clears throat> one thing that still I wish to find one day is the police, the, the, the swear of the murder. Where is the police report? This is a big question. Where is it? Are the police <clears throat> reports generally pretty complete, you'll see? I mean, you, you, find, you find the files are there. They haven't, uh, you know. But uh, some of the files they took maybe to England, some of the, the files yeah, were left in Israel. Mm -hmm. And uh, the archive of uh, the secret British police is not open to the public yet. It was, uh, it was moved into the Israeli army. So it's a part of the Israeli army archive and uh, some file, are, it was never uh, well cut, you know, it's, it's impossible to find anything. So maybe one day they will make order. And maybe one day the, the original police uh, file of Starkey murdered will be found. It will be very interesting to, to know what was the happening. So. Indeed. So the mystery is not quite yet resolved. Thank you. Well, I've had one more, um, 
chat question, which I will uh, read um, from David Shamash, though it seems to me perhaps the lecture has already answered it. Do you know why Starkey was assassinated if he was, and was it an Arab who did it? Well, I think what we had was an explanation of the assassination. I don't know if you there's anything that could be added to that question. Presumably it was a local person of some kind, uh, uh, and therefore Arab. Um, uh, so, um, Yossi, do you want to add anything? No, I think that it's clear. In any case, it's local population. Either they are uh, people from Hebron and Chalchul, which are uh, nearby big uh, settlements, that, but they used to shoot on the Hebron uh, Jerusalem road. Why should they go to the small road coming from uh, Beth oh. Jubrin? And uh, another thing that uh, the taxi driver came uh, that day already at noon, and Starkey didn't leave the camp till uh, five o'clock in the evening when it was already dark. But it meant that the murderers has time to organize. They saw that they knew, probably everybody knew that he will go to the Rockefeller Museum to give the keynote address. And the taxi came already by noon. So uh, these people who are looking for revenge, they have, it was perfect for them. They just uh, go up from the village, uh, 10 kilometers up uh, to the road. They, wait in, they wait till he came. They took him out and tell him, look what, you didn't pay us, and so on and so forth, and they killed him. If it was a terror attack, they would just shoot and run away. Why did they talk with me? Great. Um, now, I'm not getting the chat questions. That may be, ah, yes, thank you. Um, now they are coming. Rachel, um, do you, uh, would you like to ask it yourself or? Right. Uh, yeah. um, I was just interested because I know you've written quite a bit about the railway that Starkey was using and just looking at his, you know, sort of previous work in the region when he'd been working for Petrie, they didn't have this type of system. So I was just wondering if your research in the archives gave an indication of what made him adopt it? Um, you know, was he maybe influenced by what they'd been doing at Megiddo, because they'd had a railway there for some years? And do you think maybe he adopted it because he had much better funding than Petrie had had, for example? Starkey was uh, very well funded, so he could do anything he wanted to do. But I think that all the time uh, he's competing with Megiddo. And a uh, year before uh, he has the, uh, the light train in... Uh, at Lachish, he went a year before to Megiddo, and uh, he talked with the PLO guy about uh, the Decouville train and about uh, how they're organizing these things. And I have another example that in Megiddo, they discovered the water installation, yeah. the big water work, and Starkey all then start dreaming about finding one like this at Lachish. <laughs> and uh, there is a letter, I need to publish it, I didn't do it yet, but there is a letter sent by Lemon, the, ex the director of uh, Lachish at the time, and he sent to Starkey all the details about how the water installation was done. This is not appearing at all in the, uh, in the report. The report. In the report, they're giving the dimension and photograph of everything. But in the letter, he said how many working days, how much oh. it cost, what kind of uh, uh, lights they were using when they were inside. I mean, all the technical apparatus, how this wonderful installation uh, was uh, dug, is summarized in this letter. So it's a wonderful it letter. Must have taken them a hell of a long time. It's a pretty big thing. In Megiddo, and Starkey himself uh, dug the, what is called the big shaft in the, mm. no, in the southeast corner of Tel Achish. He spent a, a year and a half, hundreds of people excavating there. He went down 30 meters and nothing was found. I also had a dream to find a water installation at Lachish. I believe that it's in the northeast corner, not the southeast corner, because we have a depression there. And two geophysics make survey and they found it. Ah, oh, okay, interesting. Thank uh, you. There is a water <laughs> installation in uh, Lachish, but it's just waiting to be excavated. Can I just add, may, may I interject a slightly irrelevant question? I did wonder whether those, the, those railways are based on the kinds of things they used in the coal mines. You often see these pictures. Is, is that where it come from, came from, from British industrial uh, activity? 
<laughs> it's called the Couville train because it was invented by a French engineer, uh-huh. and it was used in a variety of uh, different uh, purposes, like military activities, and in farming, and constructions, and also in mines. Mm-hmm. And uh, one time, uh, Starkey complains that uh, he ordered more, t- more rails and more uh, trucks, but he complains that because there was a gold mine <laughs> who ordered, also, uh, so the factory gave prior- priority to the gold mine, uh, and he had to wait, you know, <laughs> till he has a supply, <laughs> give supply to him. That wasn't in Palestine, the gold mine. <laughs> Maybe uh, South what, Africa. So. Can I just ask, what happened to the railway after the dig closed? You know, I wrote an article about it in a journal called Strata. Do I you did, know about I, this I don't journal? remember the details. <laughs> you are one of the editors. <laughs> okay, uh, no. what's this Sorry. bit, you know, if you go to Megiddo today, you still see the dig house, but in Lachish you see nothing, or almost nothing. Yeah. only fences that Starkey organized. And I always ask myself, why you have a dig house in Megiddo, but you don't have a dig house in Lachish? And then I found a, a letter written by Lancaster Harding in uh, 1942. He was asked by the Wellcome Trust to get rid of uh, the camp and the equipment. There was a constructor in Haifa that bought everything, all the equipment, for uh, 1,000 pounds. So everything was taken to Haifa. And the dig house, he wrote specifically Lancaster Harding that uh, all the stone will be dismantled and crushed to, mm. for uh, construction of roads. So when you drive on roads in the area, you know that the stones at the base of the, the road are uh, from the, the dig house of... Well, uh, Early example of recycling, very good. Recycling, yes. So we have an interesting observation from Nick Brett. Where where are you, Nick? Um, Would you like me to read it or are you... I don't know where Nick is. I will read it. Just a comment. The Mandate Authority had an enormous problem trying to establish a land registry for each plot of land as many claimants came out of the woodwork to claim ownership. This was reported in the PEQ, uh, I suppose he means repeatedly. The land ownership problem at Lachish was therefore not an, an isolated example. Simply an observation, uh, Yossi. But what is surprising, I read the, 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 the village of Kubebe has altogether 5,000 dunams. Okay, the top of Tel Achish is about 80. When Starkey wanted to excavate around the tail, there was no problems because it was large area, so he found people who were ready to sell him a land here to build the dig house, another place to, uh, where he dug the Foss temple, and another place where he put uh, the, the spoil. So he didn't have any problem buying land around the tail because it was, uh, there was a lot of land. Then the slopes. The slope has no value for agriculture. So again, he'd have no problem. He bought all the slopes and he dug uh, the two kilometer of city wall all over. But the top, only 80 dunam. What is the percentage of these out of uh, 5,000? 1%, less than 1%. And this area, he have problems uh, to buy because the landowners knew that this is, uh, you know, the most important part of the tale. And they knew that it's, it's like a goose that uh, laid golden eggs. And they were thinking that uh, the sky's the limit. They can ask more and more and more and more. And when they came with an offer of two, it means that they were ready to, to uh, get one, one and a half pound. And this was the mistake. He said, okay, I pay you two. And he gave them half immediately because he was exhausted after almost two years. He has all these wonderful equipment and people and resources and dig house, and he was not able to excavate. Is there anything more frustrating than this? Thanks, Yossi. It's it's fascinating to consider that, um, in a way, the archaeologists were operating on their own, uh, acquiring land and so on. The the, uh, Mandate Authority took no responsibility for such negotiations. it's but they, ex- they expropriate the land in the end, so... In the end, yes. So a, a very strange mix. Well, um, we have um, 
Uh, Rachel, you have something to say? Yeah, it was just uh, just a comment really that um, it makes me wonder a little bit why he was so keen to buy the land rather than lease it, because that was the practice at some other sites, they would just pay the landowner for the loss of the crops for however many years they wanted to work on it, and then agree to sort of restore it to its original condition afterwards. Um, do you have any information about that? He said that it's unacceptable. He didn't oh, okay. want to do it. He wanted to buy it. But here I can tell you something that you might have interest in, Rachel, because uh, mm -hmm. you wrote about Lancaster Harding, how he became the uh, head of the Department of Antiquity of Jordan, and that Stucky wrote three letters, recommendation letter for him. Yeah. But it turned out that the, the, the delegations that came, came to Starkey, and Starkey was asked to become the head of the Department of Antiquity of Jordan. Oh. And he refused. And he said, no, I want to excavate at Lachish for 15 years. This was his vision, to excavate 15 years. And he said, you can take Lancaster Harding instead. So he released <laughs> Lancaster Harding to go and do, uh, to become the head of the Department of Antiquities. Yeah. Now think what would happen if Starkey would go to Jordan. Everything would be different. Yeah. yeah. And it was just had an interesting comment that sure. when, Starkey, when Starkey was a boy, um, it was coming up to his 15th birthday and uh, Layard had just discovered all the remains at Nineveh and his book was a sensation at that time. So he asked for that book for his birthday present and he was so enthralled by it and particularly all the reliefs in the throne room, which as we know is now Lakish, but they didn't know at that time that it was Lakeish or where, where the city was. Uh, that book inspired him to become an archaeologist. That was what he decided he wanted to be. And I always think it's like fate had destiny mapped out for him because what he later became famous for was working and discovering and unearthing Lakeish. It's as if it had all been set right from the start. So. I think Lakers should always been his dream, so that's probably why I didn't want to go anywhere else. Maybe this, but he want to go to Tel Gat in the beginning. This is <laughs> well, he did suggest two Maybe places a... to uh, Sir Henry Welcome. I have got a letter mentioning the two places, and then I can't remember now how they decided on Lakish, but I'll look it up. Um, if you find any letter or, or something that indicate why he changed his mind, it will be, this, is a, yes. this <laughs> is a missing link, because you have Tel Erani and then you have Lachish, but you don't see why they change. I mean, I couldn't find any letter that is debating between the two and then decided to go. No, I don't think I have a letter, but I have something that mentions that somewhere. Okay. But, uh, I'll have a, a look through. <laughs> Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, again, Yossi, also for your uh, wonderful answers to, to, to the questions, which have added a lot, and we uh, both to the debate and uh, perspective and, and uh, um, other quest wider questions. Terrific. And thank you to our wonderful audience for your participation and your attention. Um, I think it all worked wonderfully, but we'd much welcome feedback. Um, do send it via, via Sheila Ford by email or uh, by whatever other means um, you can think of. And also suggestions for what you would like us to put on by uh, way of lectures or other other provision. Um, so I think, Anthony, is that right? That closes our proceedings? I think it does. Those who would like to show their applause, please. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Thank, you. <clears throat> Thank you again, Yossi. So it's now dinner time in Israel. Yes, more or less. <laughs> but have a... Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure. Much. See you again. I hope you'll do another one for us. Thank you. And that you need, even without a murder, it would be good. <laughs>